celebration of women and music through a Jewish lens. We're so happy to welcome back Dr. Noreen Green, who is the artistic director and conductor of the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony, which she helped found in 1994. Uh, Noreen has conducted the uh, Jewish Symphony at Walt Disney Concert Hall, Ford Theaters, and other places we know, uh, collaborating with other artists, such as Hershey Felder, Melissa Manchester, Tova Feldshu, Theodore Bakel, Billy Crystal, and others. On December 12, 2021, just this last December, she led the LA Jewish Symphony in a long-awaited concert as part of the International Violins of Hope project at Soroya. Some of us saw and participated and enjoyed that. Soloists and several orchestra members played instruments rescued from the Holocaust. In 2020, Dr. Green's life and career was the subject of a spotlight series documentary by the Milken Archive of Jewish Music. What does it feel to have a documentary done on you? Yeah, you're not dead yet. In 2017, she was honored by Musical America, the oldest and most prestigious American magazine on classical music as one of the top 30 Musical America professionals of the year. Noreen got her Bachelor of Music Education degree, cum laude, from the University of Pacific Conservat Conservatory of Music, a Master of Music degree in choral conducting with distinction from Cal State University Northridge, and a Doctoral of Music Arts from USC. She taught choral conducting at USC and was Assistant Professor of Music at Cal State University Bakersfield and Northridge. We're so excited to have Noreen back. Thank you for joining us again today, Noreen. Thank, thank you, Joel. So we just uh, finished a talk on technology, and um, I want you to know that my assistant, Ryan, is going to be running the PowerPoint from San Diego, where she is on spring break. She's a student at CalArts. So thank you, Ryan, and uh, thank you all of you for who are on the Zoom. So here we go with technology. Let's hope it works. <laughs> So it's my honor to be here, and it's in a very appropriate uh, topic because March is Women's History Month. So uh, my talk is going to be divided into three parts. First, I'm going to speak about the unique challenges of being a woman conductor. And second, uh, about my own experience with the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony and what it's like to, to found an, an organization and uh, be the, the lead and the head of a, of a, of a nonprofit. And uh, I founded it uh, 28, going on 29 years ago. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the repertoire that I have championed of Jewish women composers. Like women in all professions of leadership, we have been making headway in the profession of uh, conducting, but we still have a long way to go. Yes. As recently as 2013, Russian maestro Vasily Petrenko, let's see if it works. There he is, <laughs> made disparaging remarks about women conductors. He was quoted as saying that orchestras react much better to men because they often have less sexual energy and can focus more on the music. Adding that a sweet girl on the podium can make one's thoughts drift towards something else. Here's my sweet girl on the podium. Excuse me? He has mental problems. He just was conducting here at the Soraya, actually. He just conducted. Um, he also claimed that when women have families, it becomes difficult to be as dedicated in this demanding business. Well, that's true of any woman who is running a corporation or has a managerial job. It, he, he tried to clarify his, his comments on, a, on his website, but it did open up the conversation and uh, talked about the controversy of what it takes to be a conductor and a woman helming a symphony orchestra. When you look at the demographics, male conductors still vastly outnumber women. In 2018, it was reported that of the world's 50th busiest conductors, how many do you think were women? Close, three. Only one was the music director of a top orchestra, and that is Marin Alsop. She is at the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. And if you're a PBS Great Performances fan, uh, a, um, 
a, a biopic of her life has just come out on PBS. It's called The Conductor, and it is marvelous. I haven't gotten to, to the end, but it's just great. And her mentor was Leonard Bernstein, as with most people of her generation. I just miss Leonard by a little bit. I'm a little too young. As of 2021, Marin is retiring uh, from the Baltimore Symphony, and the field goes back. Out of 25 major US orchestras, zero women helming symphony orchestras. But there is good news on the horizon. There, just a few months ago, New York headlines, a female conductor joins the rank of top US orchestras. And it is Natalie Stutzman, a nice Jewish girl. And she will be the only woman leading a major American ensemble when she takes the Atlanta Symphony's podium in the 2023 um, season. So you've probably seen a lot of women conductors, or if you have at the Hollywood Bowl and the LA Philharmonic, LA is much more progressive in bringing in women conductors. So yay, LA Philharmonic. To many, the art of conducting is a mystery. If you have never sat on the performing side of the conductor, you might not know what we really do. I can't tell you how many times people say to me, what does a conductor really do? The orchestra members, they all have their music, right? The violin, why do they need a conductor? And then they'll mimic what they think a conductor does, right? Well, let me uh, share a few details with you. First of all, the musicians only see their part. Okay, so here's a, a part that the violinist sees, okay? If you're an oboist, you see your oboe part. If you're a cellist, you see your cello part. But the conductor sees the whole score. So we're the only ones who know what everybody else is doing. We have to unify all of those. So, okay, that's the first thing. Now, how does the conductor communicate? We communicate with gestures, an action performed to convey a feeling or intention. If I do this to you, what are you gonna do back to me? Right, you have a reaction. If I do this to you, what are you gonna do back to me? No, if I could do this, you're gonna shake my hand, right? Because you know, this is gestures that we're familiar with. Well, all the conducting gestures are uh, known to the orchestra or the choir ensemble, and each gesture has a reaction. We know what they're going to do. The New York Philharmonic has a reputation of eating conductors alive and they are judged in five minutes. They have some very great nicknames for some of the uh, uh, conductors that they have. Here's the first one. That's called the pants presser. Here's another one. That's called the window shade puller. <laughs> Here's another one. This is the traffic cop. This one is the accuser. And then there's this one. I don't really know where I am, so I'm just gonna conduct in circles until I figure it out. That's my favorite. So I thought we have about 20 people here in person. You wanna have a little short conducting lesson? All right, so let's stand up. All right, stand tall as a tree, okay? Now, the first thing is that there is a pattern that goes with the conductor and the first thing they need to do is a get ready position. So here's your get ready position. Okay, everyone hands up like this. And then even though you're a string player, you still have to breathe just like a wind player or so you when you breathe, you give the upbeat. So breathe with me. That's the get ready position. Okay, ready. This is get ready and then upbeat and then downbeat. Okay, so get ready upbeat downbeat now the pattern for four is one one right in front of you this is with your right hand so i'm going to here i'm going to turn around so we have right hand down and then across your body is two to the other side is three and up is four so that's what we call a 4-4 pattern. Most uh, songs of pop songs for sure are in 4-4. Okay, so here's an upbeat. Breathe. And one, two, three, four, one. Now start marching your, hand, your, your feet and do that. Three, four, one. 
two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, now with your other hand, you give like signals, like this is get louder and this is get softer, okay? So try that, get louder and get softer like that. Okay, now I have to put this away because I can't have to use two hands. Now we're gonna try getting our beat going, our four, four, ready? One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Now we're gonna get louder. One, two, three. And now get softer. One, two. <laughs> so it's kind of like this, right? All right, so that's what I would do around my house is I would, you know, you have to, this has to be natural. You can have a seat now. This is a natural, right? This is the natural thing. And then you have to learn how to do these things with your left hand and how to point and how to cue. So that's a little conducting lesson for you. I hope you enjoy that home in our Zoom community. <laughs> All right. Now, so my notes over here. Since starting the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony, I have had really wonderful experiences being a woman and, and uh, creating my own business. There was one time where my contractor, the, the person who hires the orchestra, who happens to also be a woman, uh, reached out to a Russian Jewish violinist. And uh, he said he couldn't play because it was a woman conductor. It was the only time that it ever happened. He was very apologetic, but he said he just, just couldn't bring himself to be under a woman conductor. That was 30 years ago, so <laughs> probably now he would be okay with it. In 2000, I uh, was conducting in Israel at the Rubin Academy in Tel Aviv. And here the orchestra spoke at least seven different languages, English being the second language for most of them. I have a very limited Hebrew, Echad Shtayim Shalosh Habar is about it. <laughs> but a lot of the people spoke Russian. And I had brought my concertmaster with me, who is Mark Kasper, and he's a, a principal of the LA Philharmonic. And he, um, he's from St. Petersburg. So he spoke Russian, I spoke English, and my limited Hebrew, but it was like a cacophony, chaos, the first rehearsal. And I couldn't get them under control. And I didn't really know what was going on. Then there was a break. And the second half, I came back. And it was better. You know, We got down to business. Second rehearsal was good, all business, attentive, ready to work. But I just couldn't understand what had happened. We did the concert. And then the first trombone player came up to me, who happened to be a professional. There were students and professionals in the orchestra. And his very thick Russian accent said to me, thank you very much. You're the first women conductor we have had who worked at a very professional level. I said, well, thank you, you know. And then I had also women in the school come up to me and said that I was such a great role model because they had never seen a woman conductor. And I was the first woman conductor to conduct the Jerusalem Symphony. So that was a very interesting uh, uh, show because what happened was um, the first rehearsal was Motzei Shabbat, right? Right after Shabbat. And if you know, different communities have their different ideas, well, not different ideas, but you know, depending on how orthodox they are when Shabbat ends. So. When we started the rehearsal, it was right when Shabbat ended, and when the strings were there and a smattering of, of winds. And as it got darker and the three stars came out, more instrumentalists floated in, and they all would wave at me and say hello. The trumpets came in, and the trombones came in, and then most everybody was there. And finally, the tuba player walks in in complete black hat, complete Hasidic outfit, walks in, doesn't look at me, sits down, pulls out his tuba and his music, comes in on the next cue right away. And as you know, tuba players, you know, they play bump, 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 and then that's it for another 60 bars. He puts down his tuba, he takes out his Mishnah, Gamor, whatever, is studying, right on time, puts it down, brings up the tuba and starts to play. Never looked at me once. It was very interesting. Only in Israel, as they say, right? When asked about my role models as a Jewish women conductor, I always replied that I have the oldest role model to look into in the Bible, 
after the Hebrews crossed the Red Sea, escaping Egypt, it was none other than Miriam who led the women in song with her timbrel. So what set me on the path to make Jewish music my focus and ultimately create the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony? I was trained as a classical musician, studied the great traditions of European music. Why, you know, why make Jewish music my, uh, my niche? Well, I was in my last stages of University of Southern California musical. I was conducting at Temple Ramatzion. I had a choir there. I had a Yiddish choir. I was teaching at Cal State Northridge, and I needed a treatise topic. So I went to a concert at Royce Hall conducted by Roger Wagner, and he was conducting the music of David Novikovsky. And um, he lived and worked in Odessa. Do we have David Novikovsky? There he is. He worked in um, Odessa at the Brody Synagogue. And I pray to God that this war ends and that nothing happens to the Brody Synagogue or the beautiful opera house that I saw when I went there. I heard music I had never heard before, Jewish music, and it became my passion. And uh, Novikovsky uh, wrote for the synagogue. He was considered the Bach of Jewish music, uh, wrote a cantata almost every week for his professional singers. And um, here, look at all these beautiful pictures. Uh, I ended up making uh, Novikovsky the subject of my doctoral treatise. Here it is, my doctoral treatise. It's a very interesting story. It reads like a Hollywood movie, but it's a subject of another lecture. And in fact, um, because of the war that's happening and he was from Ukraine, I will be giving a lecture through the Lowell Milken Center of Jewish Music um, on April 25th in conjunction with the Cantor's Assembly on the music of Novikovsky. So you can find out about that if you are on our website. It was there and through Novikovsky that my eyes were opened to the vastness of Jewish music. The next summer, I attended the prestigious Summer Aspen Music Festival. We can skip ahead to the Aspen Music Festival and was immersing myself. There I presented a concert of Jewish music. And at the time I was just hired by Valley Beth Shalom to be the music director. And I started the idea of the LA Jewish Symphony at Aspen, and then it converged here at Valley Beth Shalom. And I had an orchestra and I had a choir. I had a very supportive rabbi, Rabbi Schulweis, who said, come and think out of the box and present music here. And a supportive Chazan, uh, Herschel Fox, who had no ego about me bringing in guest artists. And over 20 years, it was a remarkable um, shidduch that we had here. So I'm going to now turn to some of the uh, music that I've championed, uh, which is, um, as a woman conductor, I thought about the fact that I wanted to um, support and highlight and contribute to the vastness of, of Jewish music with women composers. So um, in 2000, at Royce Hall, I presented a new oratorio, Woman of Valor. It was the culmination of five years of work. I had this dream to commission a woman composer to create an oratorio based on the women of the Bible with text through a women's eyes featuring voices of women. And the dream became a reality with composer Andrea Clearfield, who I met in Aspen in 1993 when my teacher, Murray Sidlin, handed me her piece to conduct. It was serendipity. And um, his advice, Murray Sidlin's advice to me, was to always work at the highest level, which I have taken to heart, and to have concrete five-year goals. And Women of Valor became that first goal. And uh, Almost two decades later, in 2016, we released our first professional CD recording, and it was Women of Valor. And I have some CDs back there if you're, if you're interested in, in donating to the symphony and getting a CD. Um, we're going to dig into the highlights now of this music. It's a 60-minute oratorio. I was very fortunate to have Tova Felcher, there's Tova, who legendary Broadway 
star and, and uh, TV to narrate the CD. And uh, here we're going to watch a promo of the video so you can kind of get an idea of what, it, what it's about. Shalom. My name is Noreen Green. I am the founder, artistic director, and conductor of the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony. Women of Valor is a celebration of women from the Bible. Modern poetry and prose, together with ancient texts, tell the stories of 10 extraordinary biblical women, each from their own perspective. inspired by this for several reasons. One is because I felt that, like Noreen, that the women in the Bible needed to be highlighted, their stories needed to be told, and I wanted to create a musical midrash that would celebrate the women's stories in the Bible. I decided that um, the piece wanted to have in it musical materials that were all related to aspects of Jewish history, um, there's Sephardic music, there's Israeli uh, folk elements, there are traditional melodies, melodies that were sung to the Eshet Chayel. Um, all of that is sort of woven into the piece um, framed by my contemporary music language. It's such an honor. I absolutely adore this piece. Um, it's a superb piece of music, as most of Andrea's music is. Um, and it really connects so deeply with, I, I, I would say, the the feminine condition in general, and specifically the, the Jewish one. It, it moves me to tears, which is not such a good thing when I'm recording, <laughs> but I'm really grateful to be doing it. Something rang a bell emotionally for me just because it's about uh, my ancestors. The range is so immense and it goes all the way down to the bottom of my voice and all the way up to the top and, and that allowed me the freedom to also express myself as an artist. <laughs> If you would like to purchase this historic recording, order your copy of Women of Valor directly from Albany Records. You can also find us on Amazon or iTunes. There we go. Yeah, we can stop there. <laughs> Robin's doing something technically. Are we ready to go on? OK. Um, so this oratorio, uh, Hila Plitman is, um, and Renat Shahamra, both originally from Israel. Hila is a Grammy award-winning uh, soprano, and I actually um, met her on a cold audition. We had we were holding auditions for the roles of soprano and mezzo soprano, and Hila walked in. I, I was holding the auditions here at Valley Beth Shalom, and she walked in and she sang for Andrea and I, and we just. She had just graduated from Juilliard, and so we feel like we discovered her. But now she's a Grammy Award winner. So let's take a look at some of the fav my favorite arias um, from this Woman of Valor. The first one uh, are about the two sisters, the first two, Leah and Rachel. We all know the story of Leah and Rachel. Um, Jacob fell in love with Rachel, and her father Laban made him work seven years and then tricked him into marrying the older sister, Leah. So, Think about it from the women's perspective. What was Rachel thinking the night of that marriage? Knowing that Jacob thought he was with her, Rachel, but instead was with her sister. And what was Leah thinking? Like Jacob thinks she's Rachel. Imagine that wedding night, you know, and what was going on in Rachel and Leah's mind. Andrea studied dozens of poems about Leah but chose the one for the oratorio because she wanted a poem that presented Leah in an empowering position. Even with her story and life situation, in this poem, Leah knows who she is and states it several times. He didn't know who I am, but I know who I am. I am Leah. 
And then for Rachel, she chose a more provocative poem. Uh, it has an exotic landscape. And it still refers to her grief, knowing that Jacob is with Leah, but uh, it's in a Sephardic style and it's sensual and plaintive. So we're gonna look a little bit at Leah's text while we listen to the piece. So here's Leah. Laban had two daughters, okay? And he didn't know that, this is the Genesis. This is the, uh, and then he didn't know I was Leah, but I, I was Rachel. Rachel said, Rachel like a lamb, the grass becomes part of stems or part of you. Give me my wife for my time is fulfilled that I may, so he goes, she goes back and forth from the biblical text and the other text. All right, so we're gonna listen. Laban had two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. Rachel was shapely and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. stop there and now we're going to go to Rachel and uh, you can hear the difference in the, the orchestration and the style of the of the song playing Rachel So you can hear the difference in the, in the darkness of Leah's aria and then the more lightness of Rachel, but you can still feel the grief when she talks about Leah, her sister. We're now going to go to Yocheved, since it's right before Passover. And uh, who was uh, Yocheved in the Bible? No, Moses' mother. Moses' mother. So imagine, all you moms out there, taking your precious baby boy and putting him into a basket, into the Nile, and wondering what will happen to him. So this uh, aria is uh, written by, the text is written by a local Angelino, Sandy Shannon, and musically, it's the setting is a lullaby. And it's like the, it's like the river, Nile, is going to rock the baby to sleep. You hear that in the music, but then you also hear like the flutes going, and different shaking, like 
but there's like an ominous factor. So those two things are going on at the same time. Here's Yochevet. A certain man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. The woman, Yochevet, conceived and bore a son. And when she saw how beautiful he was, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket for him and caulked it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child into it and placed it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And his sister Miriam stationed herself at a distance to learn what would befall him. There's a wind that blew the dark news to me. A pharaoh's harsh and ugly decree. That my firstborn Moshe was soon to die. So I hid him in the river where the reeds are Okay, well, we're going to stop there. So you get the idea, the contrast between the, uh, the foreboding, we don't know what's going to happen, and the, the gentle rocking. And the last excerpt I'm going to play is Miriam. As I said, she was my uh, inspiration for being a conductor. And in this text, Andrea, uh, Miriam, she chooses a text that reveals the prophetess in all of her power, her full power, and describes the exuberance that she and the Israelites must have felt after leaving the Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. This is from a live performance at the Gindi Auditorium. This is Hila, Grammy Award winning now. When I first met her, she just graduated Juilliard, and now she's won multiple Grammy Awards at the Gindi Auditorium. Okay. okay, we're going to go on. Wanted to highlight a few more uh, composers. Michelle Green Wilner, who you might be familiar with, um, she uh, uh, is uh, from Toronto, and she has started with the the Jewish Children's Community Choir that was from the Schulweis Institute. And uh, I met her many years ago, and this. Uh, uh, we're going to hear is her Sim Shalom, which we performed right here at Valley Best Shalom. She's an award-winning composer, and like I said, from Toronto to here, and um, 
Here's her Sim Shalom, just a little excerpt of Sim Shalom. That's our new logo. And then we close uh, with Sim Shalom, which is from the Sabbath liturgy, and it's in the swing style, and it'll have you dancing out in the aisles. Next, we have uh, Mayor Warshower. Uh, she's a composer from the Midwest, and um, she, uh, let's see, we're going to hear a little bit of her Like Streams in the Desert, which I performed at the 350 Years of Jewish Music in America at the Ford Amphitheater. And I always talk about the music before I perform it, so you'll hear my little spiel about Like Streams in the Desert. It's like all these different uh, streams of, of ethnicities and culture that come to Israel. Welcome to the Ford Theater, our second year here. We're so happy to be here, and we're happy that you're here, too, to celebrate 350 years of Jewish life and music in America. Yeah. <laughs> the celebration started in September of 2004 all across the United States, marking this auspicious occasion. And we are very proud tonight to add our musical voice. Our story begins in 1654, when a small group of Jews landed on the shores of New Amsterdam, now called New York. They were fleeing Brazil and seeking refuge. These were Sephardic Jews. And tonight, we start our program with a piece by Meira Warshauer, Like Streams in the Desert. In this piece, Meira researched themes of the Moroccan Jews, the Greek Jews, and the Yemen Jews. She weaves these melodies together in a stunning orchestral piece. I love this piece because it has all the colors of the Sephardic and Oriental cultures. It's one of my favorites to present at our education car concerts because the children can really hear all the different colors and textures. I know you enjoy our tribute tonight to the first Jews, those 23 Jews who came to America, Sephardic Jews with like streams in the desert. Oh, there we go. All right, we're going to stop just because we. I want to get to a few, one more, and uh, we're running um, on time. I want to give you a chance to uh, have some questions. 
Uh, so I was going to do Sharon Farber, who is from Israel. Uh, I've done a lot of her music. In fact, our upcoming concert, which is on uh, June 12th at the Gindi Auditorium, we're going to be featuring a work by uh, Sharon called Ashkina, which means love in Turkish. And the whole concert is about all the different Middle Eastern colors uh, coming together, and her piece represents that. We have a uh, Turkish... Uh, pianist, and we're going to be playing a Turkish piece. The pianist has converted to Judaism, and her mission is to bring the Arabic cultures and, and the Jewish cultures together. And so we're going to have a Kamancha player, an Oud player, a Ney player, a lot of Middle Eastern music, and uh, Sharon's Ashkena starts the program. So if you want more information, again, on our website. Uh, so let's skip... Um, uh, Naomi Shemer is the first woman of song in Israel. She wrote, of course, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. Again, we're not, we're going to skip that. And um, keep going. Maria Newman is a dear friend. She is uh, uh, Alfred Newman's daughter. Uh, uh, nine-time winner, uh, Academy Award winner. We just saw the Oscars last night. Maria Newman is the youngest daughter of Alfred Newman. And uh, she's the classical composer. Her, she comes from a film music background. Uh, her, her brothers are David and Tom Newman, both multiple Grammy and Oscar winners. Her cousin, first cousin, is Randy Newman. And Maria, I, co I commissioned her to write a piece called Shirat Hayam, uh, based on the Song of the Sea that was presented in Malibu for um, Marcello's uh, Ginlin, who's the Cantus there, a 10th anniversary. But we're going to skip that just because I want to give people a chance to. Um, I'm going to play this one. So, Melissa Manchester, she uh, is a, an incredible composer, as, as you know her as a pop star, right? Uh, don't cry out loud, just keep it inside, um, and ice castles. But she is an amazing composer, a lyricist, and she wrote a Hanukkah song called Be, be the Light, or Let There Be More Light. And uh, during the pandemic, when we couldn't sing together, we uh, created, I created some virtual uh, choir and orchestra videos. And one of them was Let There Be More Light. And Melissa uh, allowed us to do this. And so I thought we would end um, my talk by watching this entire uh, wonderful Hanukkah song. <laughs> Just for eight nights But every day of your life Let every mitzvah Bless every precious day There are so many ways To let there be more light Happy Hanukkah Happy Hanukkah Happy Hanukkah from my heart to yours Happy Hanukkah Happy Hanukkah From my heart To yours Let there be more light Let there be more light Not just for eight nights But every day of your life Let every mitzvah Bless every precious day. There are so many ways to let there be more light. Oh, happy Hanukkah! Happy Hanukkah! Happy Hanukkah! From my heart to yours. Happy Hanukkah! Happy Hanukkah! From my heart. To yours, let there be more light. Let there be more light. Not just for eight nights, but every day of your life. Let every mitzvah bless every precious day. There are so many ways. Let there be more light. Happy Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah. 
Well, there you go. Any questions about uh, anything that you've seen or heard or, or uh, questions about how it all works? <laughs> and there, so, there's my website if you want to go there and sign up to be on the mailing list. And if, you have, if you're on Zoom, you can uh, type your question into the chat room or wave your hand and uh, we'll try to catch you. So I'm going to start. I have a quick question. Um, Zubin Maida is going to be in town um, in a couple of weeks. I, you, I think he's in town now. Oh, now. Yeah. Are you going to be seeing him? Or? No, I, I'm, I'm not. But I, uh, I, he was one of my inspirations uh, very early on when I was at, at USC. He was the conductor Here. of the of the Philharmonic, and I would come and I would sit in the fourth row and look at him and almost feel his sweat coming <laughs> off. <laughs> and of course, he hired my concert master. So, um, but no, I, I don't have time to go and see, and see everybody. <laughs> yeah. Pardine, uh, come. We, we, we well, they, uh, then 16, they were yes. escaping uh, from Rhodes, I think, right? Rhodes. Yeah. Mm. When did the Syrians come then? There were I Syrians don't. as well who came very early. If you have a question about conducting no. or that kind of stuff, I'm happy to answer, but I don't really know all the history. Hi. Um, we've watched several concerts where the conductor isn't really there. I mean, he's the guy sitting, playing first violin or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Typically Joshua Bell, we, mm -hmm. want, we were there a couple of weeks ago. How does that work and why do we need a conductor during the performance? I can understand during the rehearsals. Right, well, the, the conductor is the reminder for what we've worked in at rehearsals. And, you know, so when there's no conductor and there's a soloist who is a strong leader, then they can do that and they rehearse that way so they know and the, and the, the, the soloist actually becomes a conductor as well. So when the, the, when the soloist is in front of the orchestra, the orchestra needs a conductor to keep it all together because the, the bassoon player in the back and the timpanist in the back can't hear the person in front. So the conductor is there to make sure everything is together. And in outdoor concerts, what you do is you put monitors in the back so that everybody can hear. But in the olden days, there weren't monitors and the conductor really was the timekeeper. In, in, in Mozart's time, he played the piano and he had a you know, big stick that was keeping time. Lully, you know, uh, he was the conductor and he, he had a big stick and he missed one time and hit his foot. Uh -huh. And he, did you know about that story and got gangrene and died? <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous profession. Also, when I'm doing music, I do a lot of new music. So the, the musicians had never heard the music before, and we have three rehearsals. So they're looking to me for tempo changes, dynamics, phrasing, all this stuff. Yeah, they can read the notes, but to, for a unifying force, the conductor is the one that has to do it. Well, you know what? I, the baton has flipped out of my hand a couple times, and people have ducked. You know? But I have a question. Yeah. How about technically? Um, about how many beats are you conducting ahead of the actual music? And when you see when any of the players within the orchestra are seeing your conduction, it's not what they're playing in terms of beating. So doesn't it end up being confusing seeing you and and putting that together with what's being played at that moment? So you're, you're never conducting a head. So it's very interesting. Um, I always talk, I talk about in my, another lecture, there's a, a book called Why Conductors Live to 92. Like conductors ha or have the longest life, unless like Leonard Bernstein, he was drugs and, st if, if you leave a healthy life, conductors live a long life. 
You're thinking in three time zones at the same time, all the time. You're, think, you're thinking in the present because you have to conduct in the present with the musicians. You're thinking in the future because you have to prepare the cue ahead of time. So if you're conducting and someone is coming in on the second beat, you have to one, two. So your brain has to prepare it ahead of time, right? So you're thinking in the future. And during rehearsals, you're also thinking in the past because you have to remember the mistakes that were made so that when you stop, you can correct them. But in performance, you're always in the present and the future, not the past. You don't have to worry about the past. No, it's not. Really? The reason is, is because there's a delay from where you're sitting. There's a delay by the time, when, when the, the musician plays it up here, by the time you hear it there, it's a delay. But the conductor and the orchestra are together. The delay is when you're hearing it, because you're in a different, you're in further away. No, the conductor, the conductor and musicians are together. The sound is played, and then it's projected over the conductor, and then you hear it. You see, so it's 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 kind of. It, it does always seem there's a delay, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's an it's an audio delay. It has nothing to do with what's happening on the stage. It's, it's exactly the visual versus the audio. If you want to come to rehearsal, June 8th and 9th, I'll be here, and you sit in the orchestra, you'll, you'll, you'll see it's all together. But you as an audience member hear it, it delayed. It, it's like thunder and lightning. They start out the same. Very good. But you're a distance from the event. And so, I, Noreen, you should say, get better seats. <laughs> Uh, so I have a question. It, it, it's, it's not, it's, yeah. Are, if are you, there any if Zoom you sit left? in the orchestra, you'll know it's not off. Are there any Zoom questions or in the chat? So Noreen, yeah. when you get a new piece, how long does it take you as the conductor to study that? Again, you showed us the sheet where mm -hmm. you've got basically eight sections of music. Um, well, it depends on how long the piece is, you know, and, and how familiar I am with it. Right now I'm learning this Turkish piano concerto. I've started learning it now in the concerts in June. So I've been listening to it. I just got the music last week, the scores, so I'll be working on it. So a piece like that, a 30 minute piece, that's a, a, a full orchestra and piano soloist, that's a, that's a three month process. So, but with a new piece, you've never heard it before. So, oh, with a completely so, new piece. So how do you... I mean, do you have an inner ear that you can, you hear the music? Or, well, or you, I, the first time you hear it is when the musicians all get oh, together. Oh, no, 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 no. I play it on the piano. <laughs> so I take the score and I try to play the parts on the piano. So like I'll play all the wind parts, I'll play all the string parts, and then I try to combine them together. And then a lot of times now because of computers, people are sending me computer renditions. So I get a sample of what it sounds like. But um, I remember like 20 years ago getting a piece by Jacob, Jacoba Fitcher and had, it, there was no recording, it, nothing, just a score. And I started playing through it and I started to recognize a theme, like a Shema Yisrael or something, that he used a hundred years before we were alive and he was using it in his composition. And, and so when something like that jumps out at you, it's, it's so exciting. Um, but there's one on Zoom, yeah. We, oh, we have a lot on Zoom. How do we how do we do that? Okay. Hmm. Look at this technology we have. Go ahead, ask your question. How are you? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, you're an inspiration, an absolute inspiration for on so many levels, and particularly since it is Women's Month, let's pay attention to that in the world of music. I have a question for you about whether you can share with us, was there a, a moment in your career that you feel really gave you the breakthrough that allowed you to have the freedom that you clearly have You were breaking up, so. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, 
Yeah, I was asking you, I was saying that uh, you're an inspiration uh, and it's so wonderful to have you uh, in our temple today. Uh, I was asking you, uh, this is Women's Month. We're supposed to be thinking about women uh, in all fields, in all countries around the world, actually. I, I was wondering, was there a moment in your career that you could share with us that you felt was sort of a, um, an epiphany or a breakthrough moment for you that gave you the freedom to be the person you are now in your career? Well, uh, so how do I do it? Okay. So as, as I said in, in the lecture, I, I had it relatively easy because other women conductors had broken through and I had some wonderful teachers who um, both women in, uh, at Cal State Northridge, I had a, a history teacher that said to me, um, always work at the highest level. You have to be more studious, better prepared than any other man in your class. So I took that to heart and I always did. I always came in the most prepared. And, um, and so as far as a breakthrough, I had a, um, my teacher at Cal State Northridge, who was a man, well, this is kind of funny actually, <laughs> was teaching uh, our, the conducting patterns, right? And he was asking us to do something and crossing our body and, um, we have breasts, women, that men don't have. And it makes it harder to cross your body and to do things that he was asking. And I said that to him, and he was very supportive and said, well, just make it work for you. You know, We also had a woman who was uh, left-handed, and that is also different. But uh, I, like I said, I was very fortunate that I didn't have obstacles in my way. I had supportive, a supportive husband actually that was very important to uh to allow me to do what i needed to do so so it's always a joy to watch you when Thank you're you. conducting and to watch your choirs unbelievable i was part of that for a bit so fabulous um i want to know what your curve was with music how did you start what did you start with and what did you have to accomplish and when you were learning uh, to conduct you were only the only female in the class um, well, learning? I, so I started as a choral conductor. So I started piano when I was five, and um, and then I was in orchestra and choir in um, elementary school. But there's not a lot of things for a pianist to do in an orchestra. You either have to play percussion or something. So I gravitated towards choir, and I was an accompanist for the choir. And then when I was in high school, I was student music director of Fiddler on the roof. <laughs> um, and then I decided I, I wanted to make uh, teaching music my profession. So I went to college in music education. And I have a degree in music education. And I taught high school choir for a couple years. And um, then that wasn't gratifying enough. And so I went back for my master's. And when I got my master's, this was all in choral music. I did everything in choral music um, at Cal State Northridge. And then I knew that if I wanted a tenured position at a university, you had to have a doctorate. So in choral music, it was more even as far as men and women go. Um, but then when I got to USC, there was, there was more men and all my teachers were men. But as I said, I was the most, you know, I would go in to be the most prepared in my class. And it really wasn't until I was at Aspen that I really switched over to orchestral conducting. So by the time I got there, I was already a seasoned choral conductor. And so switching to orchestra was just kind of, like I didn't play in orchestra a lot, so there was a mental shift there. And learning the scores are different, but I started with choral orchestral. So orchestra as the accompaniment to choir and then moved into orchestral. So that was kind of my trajectory. <laughs> well, Noreen, as usual, thank you so much. This my was pleasure. fascinating. <laughs> so nice to have you back. Thank you. Great to be back. I'm in home court here at Valley Best Shalom. <laughs> yes. Yeah, pay attention. Uh, did you stop the recording? Okay, great. So um, 